All right, so in the first set of uh, lectures uh, in this class, we uh, talked about uh, the process of reconstruction, assembling all this biological information. We need uh, uh, to build the um, uh, genome scale models. Uh, and we, we call this uh, a reconstruction process, um, but some people like the phrase uh, assembly of a reactome in analogy to assembly of a genome. So now what we're going to do is to take a reconstruction and convert it into a mathematical format and start uh, studying uh, the mathematical properties of a reconstruction. And remember, there is no theory in here at all. It's simply recasting the knowledge we put into a reconstruction in a mathematical format. And then we interrogate the properties of that mathematical format. So whatever those properties are, they come uh, straight out of the data that we have assembled um, uh, to put the reconstruction together. Okay, so there's going to be, I think, four or so lectures in this category that we'll go through. And the first one is on the uh, stoichiometric matrix. <coughs> and I thought I should start out with this diagram here from the first lecture to get us oriented. So the uh, uh, creamy colored box there, number two, is the reconstruction process that we've uh, gone through. And we're going to be proceeding down this diagram. And what we're going to be doing in part two of the class is to go from level two to level three. And that uh, means that we're going to mathematically represent the uh, reconstruction. So we can do all these computations that are shown in blue uh, in the third step in that diagram. So here's a screenshot uh, from the textbook. And there is a quote uh, here on top uh, to the uh, former director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, uh, Marvin Kassman, uh, who was emphatic um, about the fact that uh, the life sciences had to become more mathematically oriented. And in this quote, he says that over the last 30 years, uh, the life sciences have been a refuge for those that want to do science without mathematics or without doing numbers. And I guess that refuge is getting smaller and smaller now. And basically, as shown at the bottom here, what this involves is a transition from this icon of a network that is so familiar in the life sciences to this icon of a mathematical matrix that is so common to those doing computer science uh, 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 or any kind of numerical simulation uh, or engineering. So that's um, the transition that the class will go through. Uh, now, okay, so the outline of this uh, lecture is as follows. First, I want to talk to you a little bit about the stoichiometric matrix and the incredible uh, number of uh, uh, attributes uh, that are associated with this matrix, uh, generally speaking. And then I'll go specifically through four of them. First um, is the fact that the stoichiometric matrix uh, uh, describes chemical properties and it describes the chemistry that we've assembled uh, um, in that reaction list that represents the reconstruction. But there's also an incident ma <coughs> incidence matrix or a connectivity matrix. So it's a matrix that describes the structure of a network. And I think, if I, as I mentioned before, connectivity matrix, matrices uh, exist for things like street maps of cities. Um, you know, routing maps uh, for, for uh, servers on the internet and so forth. So the connectivity matrix and incidence matrix is a um, um, kind of a fundamental notion in system science. You know, how a system is actually put together. What is its topology? What is its structure? So we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, the stoichiometric matrix is also a matrix. So uh, most of linear algebra is uh, built around matrices. And there are some very fundamental mathematical properties of this stoichiometric matrix that we will talk about as well. And finally, um, the uh, stoichiometric matrix is a key part of uh, a model, a dynamic or a steady state model that you will build to describe the functional state of a network. And the entire third part of this class is going to be focused on computing the functional states themselves. 
all right so here's a little workflow that we've been uh, basically going through part one is to build the reconstruction we do some Q, uh, QC QA tests on that reconstruction to get a proper stoichiometric matrix formulated as I'll show you in a moment and then uh, once uh, we had the matrix um, and I call it the controlled uh, format uh, the four um, studies that I mentioned in the previous slide uh, are enabled. So let's uh, talk a little bit about this matrix broadly. So uh, as we saw in the lectures on reconstruction, there's a lot of different pieces of information that goes into forming uh, the stoichiometric matrix. And this little table uh, makes that a little more explicit and also talks about these numerical properties. All these different uh, attributes listed on this slide are reflected in this matrix that is filled with integers and as I'll show you later it's almost empty there's very little in it but yet this matrix represents all these different attributes uh, listed in this table so let me just talk uh, through them briefly so first is the informatic basis for it and um, we have talked about that at length in the previous lectures we build it mostly based on the annotated genome of the target organism and a deep survey of the bibliomic data that's available for that organism or next of kin, um, you know, whatever information we can dig out of the literature to build this matrix. The second property here is uh, that it is the fact that it represents chemistry. And with chemistry come all sorts of laws and, and all sorts of uh, restrictions. That, we, uh, that we'll talk about. The, the basic fundamental um, uh, laws of chemistry come into play. And one of them is conservations. For instance, conservations of elements. The whole matrix has to be elementally balanced. Otherwise, it may create or destroy elements. And that, of course, doesn't happen. Same thing is true with charges. And same thing is true you know, the charges, the electrical charges on the molecules. And the same thing is true with a number of other chemical properties that I mentioned. So they have to be properly represented in here. Then there is a genetic aspect to it. So um, a stoichiometric matrix is really a property of a genome. There can be ma many variations of that genome in terms of sequence, uh, sequences of the open reading frames in a population. But if you have a population of organisms, say yeast you're growing in a, in, in a culture flask, the, the stoichiometric property is a property of the genome of all those organisms. So it, it's kind of a species or a strain property. But it, each individual can have genetic variations within it, uh, uh, which are represented by sequence variations uh, in the genes. Um, so um, then if you look at... Uh, uh, stoichiometric matrices of many different organisms, we can therefore use it as a basis to compare species, what's different between them, because it's a genome property. And we saw a little bit that, for instance, uh, in the uh, segment we had on uh, uh, communities, uh, namely where we can see evolution over time by successively calculating a stoichiometric matrix that describes evolution of a species from uh, a strain, I should say, or a species from one form to the next. And that's something we call distal causation. So the stoichiometric matrix can be used to study changes over successive generations um, um, of your target organism, or more broadly, in a whole branch in the phylogenetic tree. And ultimately, maybe the whole phylogenetic tree can be studied through a stoichiometric matrix if you have validated matrices throughout those uh, branches. Okay, then there are some other mathematical and the numerical properties that are of interest here. <clears throat> um, so in terms of mathematics, um, I said that it's comprised of integers. And we'll see that uh, in here. Now integers are exact. It's kind of like digital information. There is no error. Either it's zero or one. So there's no given that. It's not a real number with an error bar. It's exact. It's a precise num uh, matrix. So it's something that we call a knowable object. Like a DNA sequence, similarly, is a knowable object because it's a, it's, a no it's a sequence of base pairs and they can only be one of four types at each position in the sequence. So we also think of sequence as a knowable object. 
Um, and the same thing with the stoichiometric matrix, it's a knowable object. Uh, so, and in fact, it's fundamental. It's a, it's a very fundamental attribute um, of a genome. Now, it describes a system uh, like we talked about, <clears throat> and we are going to learn about uh, the different uh, spaces of this ma matrix, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. And also, so thermodynamic properties show up how you pull together different parts of a network into a into a module uh, um, and so forth. That's also a property of, a, of the matrix. But that's something you analyze from a system science point of view. And then finally, <clears throat> uh, with respect to numerics, like I said, it is a, a digital uh, matrix, if you will, just integers. It is very sparse, uh, and as I'll show you for genome scale matrices, less than one in 100 element is non-zero. So often you can do sparse matrix calculations, therefore, uh, with a genome scale stoichiometric matrix. And stoichiometric matrices for metabolic networks are well conditioned uh, because all of their elements are of the same order of magnitude. It is easy to do the comp computation with it. Uh, and that's nice. It means that we can do large scale optimization with it very quickly. So that's actually an astonishing array of attributes that are associated with this matrix. And each one of them are pretty, is pretty significant, as it turns out. All right, so that's um, just a brief overview uh, of this stoichiometric matrix. So now I'm going to go through four different segments in this lecture to address the four different properties that I um, uh, mentioned uh, in the outline uh, to the lecture. So first we'll talk about um, S as a, as, a, as a data matrix. So as shown in the uh, top right on this slide, the uh, values of the elements in S uh, are integers. It's 0, 1, or minus 1 mostly. Occasionally you get a 2 or a minus 2, and I'll explain why in a moment. So here are <coughs> uh, three prototypic or essentially fundamental uh, forms of chemical reactions. These are elementary chemical reactions. And the first one represents just the scrambling of a molecule. This is what an um, isomerase does, for instance. And uh, I think we talked about, or most likely will talk about, the isomerase that takes glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate. It just rearranges the molecule. So in a way, there is no reaction here. It's the same molecule is just being rearranged. The second type <coughs> is a bilinear reaction, where you have two compounds, um, maybe a carbon-containing compound and a phosphate-containing compound, that's why I picked C and P for it, and they combine into a new molecule. And so there's a chemical bond that's actually formed here. And so you have two independent um, chemical entities that come together and form a new one. And the third reaction uh, in there is uh, maybe not strictly an elementary reaction, but it's what's called an exchange reaction. So you have two molecules bouncing off another, and a moiety on one is transferred to the other. So I have a, a moiety there called a CP and an A then that react, and that, that part of CP, the, the P, is transferred to A. So this is like the m movement of a high energy phosphate bond from one molecule to another, and that's where uh, the choice of these letters comes from probably the most common reaction uh, in metabolism, moving a phosphate group around. Okay, so S is a data matrix. It represents all this information here. And uh, if I take these reactions and write out a stoichiometric matrix that describes them, we get what's shown on the right. So the columns of this matrix are the reactions, and the rows are the compounds. So if you look at the first column that represents reaction number one, you see a minus one in the first row where X1 is, and X1 designates uh, that molecule CP, because it disappears in that reaction. So one molecule disappears. And then if you look at the uh, second uh, row, there is one, or a plus one, because X2 appears. And then zero in the rest of the column, because the other molecules uh, represented by the other rows are not participating in the reaction. And then the second column is for formed in the same way, and the fourth column is formed in the same way. So this is a pretty easy process. 
and you can just layer into a reconstruction reaction by reaction and build up you know, more and more columns and there will be more and more compounds so the, the number of rows keeps expanding. Now when can we get a two in the matrix? That's when you have a homodimerization. Uh, you can have two glucose molecules reacting to form a, uh, a, a, a disaccharide. Um, and that's what's indicated by C plus C becomes C2. Uh, uh, and if I write that out further, that just means two molecules of C become that uh, homodimer. And in that case, I get a two in the stoichiometric matrix. It happens, but this is rare. So most of the time, the stoichiometric matrix will have one, zero, and minus one. And in fact, mostly zeros. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about some of the information that's associated with the stoichiometric matrix. And we talked about the GPRs, the association of genes to proteins to reactions. And now a reaction is a column uh, in the stoichiometric matrix. So all the reactions enabled by a gene or clusters of genes is going to be reflected as a set of columns. And these are uh, indicated in here. So there's a different forms of GPRs and how they map <coughs> into, a, into the stoichiometric matrix. So let me show the matrix here below. So <coughs> there are three scenarios shown here. The first one is maybe the uh, prototypical one we think about first. There's one gene encoding for one protein, and that protein carries out one reaction. And there will be one column as a result of that that appears uh, in the stoichiometric matrix. But then we may have promiscuous enzymes, like we have talked about, uh, a transaminase will be able to transaminate many different types of molecules. So you may have one gene and one protein, but many reactions. So one gene may generate many reactions. And uh, in the case of isozymes, you will actually have two genes and two, two proteins, but they do exactly the same thing. So they will just lead to the generation of one column uh, 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 de facto uh, in this matrix. And then there are more <coughs> complicated uh, GPRs than those shown here. <coughs> and they similarly relate uh, the genes to the columns in the stoichiometric matrix. <coughs> so uh, therefore, the stoichiometric matrix <coughs> has an explicit genetic basis. And this is what I've been talking about. So the gene portfolio of the target organism is represented there. Then, of course, I've also mentioned that uh, the location of the genes uh, is of course also represented, so you can map that gene onto a location uh, on the genome. All right, so this is how this mapping takes place. So when you do this, <coughs> something like this happens. Um, you have a set of reactions, like shown in that table to the top uh, left. These are the glycolytic reactions. So I have some abbreviations in the first column for the reaction. And then I have the reactions themselves, and these need to be proper chemical reactions. And then the last column in there is a gene ID that, that represents uh, the genes that have to be transcribed to make the uh, uh, protein that carries out the reaction. So in some cases, there is only one gene uh, identifier. In some cases, there is more than one gene identifiers uh, indicating multimeric proteins. And the GPRs that uh, result from that, uh, uh, the types of GPRs that may result from that, are shown to the uh, right of that. Now, down below the table, I have a matrix that basically says the same thing as it's in the table. It's just all the stoichiometric coefficients that are in these chemical equations now represented as mathematics, basically mathematical equations now. And I will have in this table a bunch of rows that correspond to the compounds, and we're going to designate that by the, uh, by the letter M. So the lowercase letter M designates the number of nodes in a network or the number of compounds in a network. And we use uh, N to denote the number of columns, and that will be the number of reactions in this network, or the number of links between the nodes, if you want to look at this through the eyes of system science. So the stoichiometric matrix is an N by N matrix. And essentially, always, N is greater than M. So you'll have more links in a network than nodes. And that has some consequences that we'll talk about uh, uh, in, in the subsequent lectures. So let me just show you what the stoichiometric matrix may look like. 
<coughs> so this is uh, an image of this stoichiometric matrix for the E. coli model that was called uh, AI-1260. And there are something on the order of, uh, what is it, there are 1,800 or so uh, uh, compounds in here and over 2,000 uh, columns or over 2,000 reactions. Now let's look at this matrix a little bit uh, and uh, observe some of its features. You see about halfway uh, th through the matrix in terms of rows, there are a few rows that are really populated with dots. So the way this image is done, there is a black when there is zero, and there is a colored dot when there is a, an integer uh, in that location. So there are a couple of rows in there that are just littered with uh, blue dots or stoichiometric coefficients. So these will correspond to compounds that participate in a lot of reactions, because a lot of the columns will have a dot in that row. So these will be molecules like water, uh, the proton, ATP, ADP, and the like. So that's one observation we have there. Then we see kind of a band-like structure, diagonal band going down there. This is a result of the way the reconstruction is done. Re reactions are being placed in in some order. Maybe you start with a pathway like the TCA cycle. So you put them in order, and as the reactions are laid in there, more and more compounds appear, so you start adding the rows. And, and this kind of um, uh, uh, diagonal uh, band that goes through there is really a reflection of how the reconstructor built the matrix. This almost tells you the order in which uh, he went through the reactions and placed them in the matrix. And this is often very, uh, this often very much follows kind of classical pathways uh, that you want to look for in the organism to begin with, but then it may diffuse as you start going through the biblion for that organism. If you look down the columns, about a third of the way, there is a column that has a bunch of just like diagonal elements. These might, uh, these most likely are the exchange reactions. So there's only a one dot per column. So, and then there's a reaction that goes to the outside. And there's no accounting for the compound on the outside. And we'll talk more about these inputs and outputs. I can randomize the sequence of the columns or the rows and it's still the same matrix, and it still is exactly the same content in it, which is kind of interesting. I could, for instance, as I'll do in a moment, order the rows by the number of entities that are in them, just to order the compounds in terms of their connectivity, as an example. So that's what it, uh, what it looks like. So here's another one. We talked about uh, Geobacter sulfur reducens a few times in the class. And so here's its matrix. And it has a similar appearance as the one I, I just showed. Now there are some numbers here on the bottom. <clears throat> in this particular reconstruction, this was an early reconstruction of Geobacter metabolism. There are 541 rows in here. So 541 compounds, 609 uh, columns. So if I multiply that out, the number of entries in this matrix are about 330,000 or so entries in there. But if I sum up the number of non-zero entries in there, I get about 2,600. So there are 2,600 stoichiometric coefficients in there. And if I ratio these two numbers, I realize that only about 0.8% of the entries in this matrix are non-zero. The rest of it is zero. And that's what I meant by what I said earlier. <clears throat> it's essentially an empty matrix but yet so incredibly informative. <coughs> and has all these attributes that I uh, just spoke of uh, when we went to that uh, table earlier. So one of them is quality control, quality assurance on this stoichiometric matrix. <coughs> and this is to make sure that the column actually represents proper chemistry. So every column in S <coughs> will be a vector, and we call it a reaction vector. And it's uh, written there as lowercase s sub i. Sometimes we decorate this also with a superscript v, meaning it represents a, um, a reaction. We do this to indicate also the fact that, or differentiate between a row vector. Sometimes we go across a row in the matrix, and then it's a lower boldface s with an uppercase x um, sub i. So the, the, those would be the row vectors. So there are row and column vectors in this matrix, and both are important. So one property of this vector uh, is the, the, the uh, reaction vector, the column vector, is that they have to be elementally balanced. So how do we balance um, uh, chemical equations? Most of you probably have bad memories, 
from your general chemistry class where you spend hours and hours and hours on elementally and charge balancing equations, chemical equations. I'm going to show you now that this can be done with one matrix multiplication, <laughs> which is nice. This is the, the power of uh, looking at systems. So here's a matrix that's called the elemental matrix. And this is just a matrix formed by the subscripts on the, on the molecular formula for compounds. So there are six different elements found in uh, organic molecules, and they are listed there. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, most prevalent, then there's nitrogen, phosphate, and sulfur. So these are the six elements that essentially all metabolites are made up of. And the columns in a matrix like this would be compounds. So there I have water. So if you look at that column, there is zero for C, because there's no carbon, one for oxygen, two for hydrogen, and zero for the rest. And the next molecule over there is glucose, six carbons, uh, six oxygens, 12 hydrogens, uh, no nitrogen, phosphate, or sulfur. So this is the way I can represent the elemental composition of all the nodes that are in my network. I'm not going to get into this here, but we can also represent the different charged forms of these compounds. And to do that, you normally then add another row in here that corresponds to the charge, where you put in minus one, zero, or one. Well, it could be minus three if, if, the, if it's negatively, uh, if, the, if there's a negative charge on that ion of minus three. So you can also put the, the charges uh, in as a row in this column, and as a row in this matrix, and each column then can be a, a charge molecule, if you like. So exactly the same procedure. So I have compounds and their elemental composition represented in this matrix. And this is also a perfect matrix. These are all integers, knowable matrix. Now, it turns out that if I multiply this stoichiometric matrix with this elemental matrix from the left, I have to get 0. Uh, so, so every row uh, in, the, in the elemental matrix is a compound. <coughs> Uh, excuse me, it's an element. And when I multiply times the column of a matrix, a column in the stoichiometric <coughs> matrix, where it will be pluses and minus, I count up how many carbons disappear and appear in that reaction. Same thing for oxygen, same for, for hydrogen. And if it's not zero, <coughs> then the reaction is elementally imbalanced, and you have to uh, uh, fix it. So here's a very <coughs> simple example of this. This is burning hydrogen, so you have two uh, hydrogen molecules, two H2s, uh, reacting with an O2 to form two molecules of water. And the elemental matrix here is very simple. It's just two elements, and you just fill it in with the compound. So the first column is hydrogen, second is oxygen, third one is uh, water. And the uh, stoichiometric matrix for this system is very simple, minus two on hydrogen, minus one on oxygen, and plus two on, uh, uh, on water. And if you do this multiplication, you should get a zero. And indeed, it is zero here, because this is a perfectly balanced uh, uh, reaction. So by multiplying a row together that says how many elements are, are in each compound, times the column that says if the compounds are disappearing or appearing, you can actually balance in one matrix multiplication all your reactions and find out those that are uh, uh, <coughs> potentially imbalanced. This also means, <coughs> excuse me, that the uh, row uh, vectors of the elemental matrix <coughs> are in the left null space of S. And we're going to get to that in a moment. The left null space of S <coughs> contains what are known as time invariants, quantities that never change. And if the elements always have to be balanced as, as, the, as the network is operating, it's, it's a time invariant balance. It's always respected under all conditions. And there are quantities like that that reside in the left null space <coughs> of the stoichiometric matrix. We'll talk more about this when we go through the matrix properties uh, of S. So it is relatively easy to get elemental composition of metabolites. This is available to you through different uh, databases. And you can download that information very easily and get the elemental uh, matrix formed. It's a little tougher to get the charge state of a molecule. <clears throat> so if you're considering, say, intracellular pH of 7.2, there are programs that will calculate for you and estimate what the predominant 
ionic state of that compound base at pH 2. And sometimes people do that and charge in elementally balanced uh, metabolic networks at pH 7.2 or 7.4. Now, <clears throat> if the pH goes to extremes uh, on the outside, the intercellular pH may go up and down, and some of those may be scrambled, then you may then have to recalculate the ionic composition um, of your metabolome or the ionic state of your metabolome. So this is straightforward to do. So let me just give you an example. This is in the text. Um, these slides are a little uh, clumsy because they come out of uh, Excel. But here's an initial uh, stoichiometric matrix for glycolysis. That set of reactions I had in the uh, uh, earlier uh, slide. So I have all the uh, 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 compounds or the nodes there and all my reactions. And, then, and in this case, including exchange reactions, things that come uh, into glycolysis and leave it. And I'll talk more about that later. I can go and get the elemental composition of all of these, and that's pretty easy. Like the first uh, column in this matrix is glucose, uh, 6, 12, 6, and zeros. And I guess in this elemental matrix there are only five rows because there's no sulfur-containing compound in here, so sulfur is not considered. It would be a, just be a zero row. And then I show here the product of E times S. And it's not zero, which means that some of these reactions are elementally imbalanced. So I can now look at this <coughs> set of uh, non-zero elements. And I see here a few um, reactions that have a minus one on hydrogen. So these are reactions that are actually consuming hydrogen if they're proceeding. This means that we forgot to put a hydrogen ion in the product list. So we have to add that now into the chemical reaction to make it proper. Um, here is one that consumes two hydrogens and one oxygen, and that's water. So water was a product of this reaction, but it wasn't in my initial reaction list. So I have to go now and fix that and put water into the list of products from the reaction. And I guess here is a, another uh, set of reactions that produces hydrogen. So we forgot to put uh, hydrogen as a reactant. And uh, here is a reaction that's missing water and hydrogen, as an example. And uh, here's another one that uh, requires uh, uh, hydrogen also. Now, the last two columns in here, uh, I want to maybe point them out. The second to last column says uh, glucose in. So this is the import of glucose. So there, in, 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 a, in a transport reaction like that, <coughs> there's nothing on the outside. There's just glucose comes in. <clears throat> so exchange reactions with the environment will be elementally imbalanced because I just all of a sudden get, you know, uh, in there. I get uh, six uh, carbon, six oxygens, uh, and six uh, and twelve protons. <clears throat> but when we balance the whole system, there will be a, an, a boundary flux somewhere else that dumps them into the environment, and the the overall inputs and outputs have to be elementally balanced and charge balanced. Okay, so here is this uh, matrix again, but now I have added these uh, two uh, rows in here, hydrogen and water, uh, to elementally balance all the reactions. So all these errors that I had in the previous multiplication is gone. And now uh, uh, E.S is zero for all the internal reactions, not the boundary fluxes. And the boundary fluxes are going to be denoted by, by a lowercase b for a boundary flux, so b sub i. So the boundary fluxes will not be balanced. But a balanced pathway that goes through the cell has inputs and outputs that have to be elementally balanced in a steady state. So this is an example of a quality control test. So I can come now with a matrix that's been, uh, been QA, it's been quality assured with respect to this chemical property. But there are others. There's a charge, for instance, like I mentioned. Okay, so uh, those are some comments on converting data into a matrix and then quality controlling it to make sure it's a proper matrix in terms of its chemical features. Now, <clears throat> let's move on to the next topic. And now we're going to move away from the world of chemistry into the world of system science. And now we're going to start to look at S as an incidence matrix or a connectivity matrix. So, <clears throat> Connectivity matrix have system science 
like attributes to them, like a graph or a map. Um, and uh, <coughs> the stoichiometric matrix has a number of maps associated with it. So if you look at this matrix from through the eyes of system science, <coughs> we don't look at the columns as reactions, but we look at them as links. And the rows are not viewed necessarily as compounds, but they're nodes in, in a map. So for instance, associated with the stoichiometric matrix is a reaction map, which are all the nodes, the metabolites, or the compounds, and links between them, which are the reactions. And this map is very familiar because um, biochemistry textbooks are filled with these kind of maps. This is a familiar map. There are no numbers associated <coughs> with it. It's just, it's just a topological representation of a network. Now, what we are going to be learning how to do in the class <coughs> is to compute a particular state of that network. What are the actual values of these fluxes that are flowing through them? And <coughs> that little uh, image here in the uh, bottom left uh, corner of the uh, slide shows the flux vector, and it has numbers in it. And it tells you what the reaction fluxes are through each one of those links, and we can map that data, that numerical data, onto my reaction map by putting numbers above there. And now I get what's called a flux map. A flux map conveys a particular state of that network. And in this case, it's a steady state map. There's one flux unit coming into that first node there, half going out uh, of the two uh, exits. And then there's a half a unit of flux going into the second node. And there's an even split there again. Uh, one quarter of that flux unit is coming out on each of the other reactions. So this is a balanced flux map. And this is the sort of a steady state flux map that we will be uh, uh, looking to compute. So no real surprises here. <clears throat> now, it turns out that if you transpose the matrix S, you also get another set of maps and, and graphs that may not be as familiar. So in this case, uh, <clears throat> the links in this map represent compounds, but the nodes are the reactions themselves. And this you rarely see uh, in a biochemistry textbook. But when you compute some of the properties of a network, you might choose this graphical representation. Not extensively used, and uh, it's an opportunity for kind of computer science type research, actually, how to visualize the transpose map, uh, or the maps of the, of the transpose of the stoichiometric matrix. So they will look like this. <coughs> You'll have a map, but the node in it is a reaction. So what flows into that node will be the link, and that's now a compound. So reaction one, there is a node, so there's a one a substrate that flows in, and two products come out, uh, and so forth. So this is called a compound map. Okay? And if I map onto this particular numerical values for the concentrations of these compounds, I get my concentration map. And so this is a way to represent all the concentrations. Um, in this case, the concentrations are the links, so I map the uh, data, the numerical data, on top of the links. Of course, in the previous map, I could also have mapped concentration data and associated it with the nodes. I can also put in this the flux uh, values, but they would now be associated with a node rather than a link on the previous slide. So here are four uh, maps that we often talk about associated with stoichiometric matrix. Okay, um, so this is related to certain duality properties that uh, some of you will recognize if you've had classes on optimization. This is just a dual view of that network. You can look at it in terms of the fluxes uh, or the concentrations. Um, and, you know, here is the matrix transposed up there and the two maps that you might associate with this matrix. In this case, I have no numbers, so uh, just uh, the reaction map and the compound map. All right, just quickly show a couple of examples. Uh, there are uh, three versions of a reaction. Uh, a equals B goes to C, and uh, <coughs> one reaction vector, so a very simple stoichiometric matrix, minus one, minus one, and a one for the columns on A, B, and C. Right below it, I've actually put this into a system, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, and drawn a dashed box out of the reaction. So now I have boundary fluxes flowing in and out. 
uh, for A, B, and C, A and B coming in, and uh, C going out. And then the last uh, box in there is when I've kind of drawn a boundary even around that, the system itself and the exchange metabolites, so it's kind of like the whole universe. So now all of a sudden I have uh, 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 external concentrations of A, B, and C, that will generate three new rows in that stoichiometric matrix. So these are three uh, 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 stoichiometric matrices representing that reaction in a different setting relative to how we view a system. And I'll show you more about that in a moment. Now, if I transpose these matrices, I get what's shown uh, uh, on the right-hand side of this slide. So now my transpose matrix is minus one, minus one, one as a row vector. And the map that corresponds to that is now a bilinear arrow that goes in, because I need A and B to flow through that arrow in the same amounts into the reaction, and then C comes out. And then you have the other two uh, uh, compound maps that correspond to uh, case two or three on, on the left. So that's just to familiarize you with these maps. You can draw these maps in two different ways, and I will talk more about uh, systems boundaries uh, uh, in a moment. Now, the more, much more common way to view reconstructions is a reaction map than a compound map. And here is the reaction map. Uh, for uh, uh, AF1260. Uh, so these are all the reactions in there, 2,000 of them or, or so, and the, uh, what was it, 1,700 or so nodes uh, uh, in it. Very complicated. And this is where we need Google Maps, like I said. You want to zoom in and out. This is really a multi-scale map where the simplest element in it may be uh, a reaction that you want to zoom in on, or you want to zoom in, zoom out a little bit and see a pathway or, and so forth or you can zoom all the way out and see the whole map, like the entire, uh, say, uh, street map of uh, San Diego, as an example. So these are things we like to uh, work with. We can map data onto these, like I said uh, earlier, and visualize that. Sometimes you map expression profiling data on there, say, onto the, uh, re uh, the reactions, and you might even have a GPR also coming out from the reaction if there are multiple genes being expressed and associated with that reaction. So this is a great way to represent the reconstruction and also uh, data or the result of a computation. Now it turns out that the compound maps are very difficult, oops, are very difficult to draw. And the reason is that we have these highly connected metabolites. So something like ATP may be flowing into 800 reactions. So that's very hard to do that, to have, to have that you know, a, 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 a arrow that braids into 800 different nodes. That's a little tough. Um, so um, that problem hasn't been solved yet, how you actually represent the compounds map on scale. For smaller maps, it's possible. And this one here is uh, shown for glycolysis, but we still disconnected the most highly connected compounds in here the proton um, and uh, ATP and ADP, because they would participate in eight of these reactions, so you'd have arrows, you know, <laughs> going between eight of them um, into eight different nodes in here. So that's a challenge, really, in visualization and kind of human interface. So that's probably why the other map is much more commonly used, at least when you're looking at larger scale um, uh, networks. So now I want to introduce you to uh, the elementary topological properties of S that are associated with these maps. There are also much deeper topological properties we'll, we'll treat in a whole separate lecture. So let's say here's a, here's a network uh, that is pretty simple. I have, what, uh, 10 fluxes in here and four nodes. I can go and form the stoichiometric matrix for this, uh, which is shown below, just through the procedure that uh, we illustrated earlier on in this, this lecture. So I have my 10 columns for all the reactions, and I have the four rows for the nodes in there. Now I can compute a few things straight from this matrix. For instance, I can compute the number of non-zero entries in every column. What would that give me? That would give me the total number of reactants and products in a reaction. 
And most of the time, this would be three or four or something like that. But you can have less. An exchange reaction, like I said, would have one. Uh, and we will also be introduced to something called a dead end in a network, which also ha have a, uh, uh, a participation of one. No, 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 excuse me, it will be a connectivity of one. And that's the next property I'm going to show here. So you can do the same thing for the rows. You can sum up the number of non-zero elements in a row. And that counts for you uh, how many reactions that compound participates in. And in this uh, system here, we have, uh, I guess, node number one uh, has the highest number of reactions coming in and out. So it's participating in the highest number of reactions in this system, which is six. And then I can compute the rest uh, um, of them. Now, if I get a one, uh, a connectivity of one, uh, uh, that means that uh, uh, there is a dead end uh, in the network. And we'll see that later. There's only, so there's only one reaction acting on that compound. And it's normally like, it's either an exchange reaction coming in from the outside, uh, uh, or we'll have uh, just a rate of formation of a compound and no way to put it after that. So it participates only in one reaction. So that's another way to do a QC, QA step on a matrix, is to figure out how many dead ends are in it by calculating that property. Um, and there are more actually sophisticated algorithms than, than that that I uh, mentioned. There is a whole uh, uh, approach called uh, gap find that will calculate these gaps for you. Okay. Um, and here just the summation showed uh, you can sum across a row or a column, uh, put the absolute values on every element, and that just sums up for you the number of non-zero elements in a row or a column. Now, it turns out that the connectivities uh, are of great interest, and a lot has been written about the distribution of connectivities in biological networks. Now, let me introduce you to that a little bit. So, this graph here schematically shows this number rho, which is the uh, connectivity, uh, rank ordered on the uh, x-axis. So I take all the rows and I rank order them from the highest to the lowest number. And then I just rank order them like, like shown here. And that can be done by matrix multiplication that is uh, indicated by that funny symbol there. Uh, by the axis, but it's basically uh, the connectivity. So I rank order them from high to low. And if I plot this on a log-log plot, this tends to be a straight line. And that means that there is a power law distribution of connectivities. And uh, uh, this has all sorts of interesting implications that people uh, uh, talked about ad nauseum, uh, about uh, 15 years ago or so, when this realization came that most biological networks, when you started uh, looking at them on scale, had this property. Why is it the way it is? Yeah. Uh, uh, what does it mean? And so forth. Uh, so you can find a lot of lit literature on that. So, but uh, from a functional standpoint, this means that there are few nodes in this network that are global in terms of their connectivities, like ATP. So any perturbation of that node, the content of that node, is going to disturb a lot of links and have a global effect on the state of that map. Conversely, uh, there are uh, uh, many nodes. Most of them have a low connectivity, maybe just one in and one out. So if there's a disturbance in that node, the disturbance is very local in the network. Um, so, it used to be argued back then that the highly connected nodes were very important because if they somehow malfunctioned or were taken down <laughs> in analogy to a computer network, the whole network might crash. And that is certainly true if you look at protein-protein interaction network. If you remove a protein, stop expressing it, it will have a big impact on that whole network. People started talking about, uh, you know, 
uh, robustness properties, attack tolerances, and so forth of lactose like that. Now, um, in metabolism, that's a little different. You cannot just remove a metabolite. You cannot just all of a sudden stop ATP. Um, so that has a different meaning in a metabolic network, and we can actually get to that in a moment. Uh, it is actually a way to look at drug discovery by putting in an analog of that compound that will now disturb a lot of reactions. Uh, so for a protein-protein interaction network, if you were to disturb uh, uh, a poorly connected node, maybe not much would happen. But if you look at metabolic network, and say you look at B12 biosynthesis, where it's just all connectivity of two, there's just one reaction making a compound and one reaction degrading it, if you take that down, there's no B12 and the whole network comes down. So poorly connected nodes are not unimportant in metabolic networks and some networks. So you have to be very careful when you're interpreting this sort of data. Yeah, okay, so this just shows uh, you know, how one would reorganize the rows in a stoichiometric matrix based on connectivities. So you can calculate the connectivities and then rank order the rows if you wanted to. And this material is actually uh, uh, covered in detail in chapter 10 in the text, and we're not going to have a separate lecture on that uh, in the class. But the most interesting parts of that chapter are summarized uh, in this slide. And then there are some specific examples of this given in the, uh, uh, in the chapter. And here we calculate uh, this distribution, this uh, power law distribution for connectivities in uh, curated genome scale models. And so there are six of them there. E. coli, Salmonella, what else do we have? Klebsiella, uh, Saccharomyces, Homo sapiens, and so forth. And essentially, always the three most uh, connected nodes are protons, water, and ATP. But then as you go down that list, you start getting things like NADH, uh, glutamine, uh, and so forth. And as you might imagine, a lot has been made of the slope of that line. Sometimes the slope is very steep, and sometimes it's very shallow. And that actually turns out to be an important property, too. Okay, so there are a few global players and a few local players as indicated on the earlier slide. And a connectivity of one, like I mentioned, are either the exchange reactions or dead ends, and they are of special interest. But you also see the line right above this, connectivity of two, there's a lot of dots there. And this is a, a log scale, so there's a lot of dots in that, that cluster. So a few highly connected nodes, most of them are poorly connected, and then there's this power of distribution in between. Very common distribution in all biological networks, not just metabolic or protein-protein interaction networks, but also in uh, social networks and so forth. And uh, uh, income distribution follows uh, uh, typically a uh, power law like this and so forth. So this is a, some fundamental property to uh, biology. All right. So those are some comments on the stoichiometric matrix as an incidence matrix. Describes the topology of the network. So we'll see uh, more of this uh, later. So let's now move on to looking at S as a matrix and see what we learn from that. So we're going to talk about um, uh, mass uh, balances or flux balances that look like this. We take every node in that network, and we, and we see that our flux is coming in and going out, and we can actually sum them up, like shown in that differential equation. Just sum up the fluxes in and out. And if they are out of balance, don't sum up to zero, there will be a time derivative associated with that concentration. Either the node is filling or draining. If the balance is perfect, the flows in and out are exactly the same, you have a steady state. And most homeostatic states are like that. They're roughly steady states. So that's a sum of uh, fluxes, and I can break this down into an inner product of two vectors. There's a vector there of stoichiometric coefficients and a vector of all the fluxes. And that's the flux vector, and this will correspond to a row in the stoichiometric matrix. And I described it there now as S sub i, and I put x as a superscript, meaning it's a row in the stoichiometric matrix corresponding to a compound. And if I bundle all of these together, if I just 
assemble all these rows into a matrix, I get my stoichiometric matrix. And so the stoichiometric matrix is a key part of a model that describes the state of a network. And that's why it's so incredibly informative about the function of a network. So we'll talk more about the model that we build based on this matrix, but let's first look at the matrix and its properties from a mathematical standpoint. So here I write that differential equation again. Um, and rather than just writing dx dt, I put x dot there or x prime. These are also common um, uh, nomenclatures for a time derivative. And I do this just to show that this is a vector of time derivatives. It's just a vector. And so what S actually does as a matrix mathematically, it takes a vector S of fluxes and maps it into another vector, which are the time derivatives of the concentrations. So mathematically, it's a mapping operation. It maps a vector in an, a vector that is uh, in an n-dimensional space, because there are n fluxes, into another space of concentration derivatives that's m-dimensional. That's why the matrix is m by m. So that's the mathematics. That's what the matrix mapping is. So this may give you a flashback to your linear algebra class. So a mapping like this has four fundamental spaces associated with it. And these are going to become very, very important properties of this stoichiometric matrix. So the vector being mapped, the flux vector in this case, lives in two orthogonal spaces, the null space and the row space. And they're orthogonal. And we'll see in a moment what is in these two spaces. The vector of time derivatives also lives in two spaces. And they're orthogonal as well. And they're called the uh, column space and the left null space. Now, the null space is actually, its proper name is the right null space. So there's a right and a left null space. But we are almost always talking about the right null space, so it's just called the null space. We already saw something about the left null space earlier when we looked at the matrix E, the elemental matrix. So in that space, we already know there are time invariants that are found in that space. So this is a fundamental property of any matrix that you work with. It has four fundamental subspaces. And since this matrix describes a network, a network function and so forth, we are very interested in knowing what is in these subspaces. And we're going to spend some time talking about that now and more in detail in a subsequent lecture. But let me just introduce to you now what is the content of these spaces. So first, the right null space, or the null space. And I just show a box there and a column vector to do, do this symbolically. So I multiply the stoichiometric matrix from the right with a column vector. And if that product gives me a 0, that means that vector is in the null space of S. And this turns out to be all the steady state solutions. All the perfectly balanced flux maps that I showed you earlier have this property. We are extremely interested in the null space because that basically contains the homeostatic states that we are so interested in. Now, the left null space is shown here. So there are row vectors that you can multiply from the left. That's shown by that horizontal line there uh, to the left of the box. That's the matrix. So it's a row vector that multiplies down every column. Uh, and therefore, it's kind of adding up the rows across the matrix. If I get a zero from that multiplication, that vector L is in the left null space of the matrix. And it represents a time invariant. And we saw that for the elements, for instance, and the charges. They have to be balanced across all the reactions. And that's a little tougher to see sometimes, so I just wrote out the mathematics here. If I take this vector L, multiply from the left through that um, dynamic uh, mass balance equation that I had, uh, I get the equation shown there in the top of that pink box. And if that's zero, then I can do some more mathematics down here. L times the time derivative of x. I can move L into that time derivative because it's a constant. So I'm taking a time derivative basically of a summation uh, of x's because L's will have numbers in them. So I'm, I'm taking L as a row vector uh, and x as a column vector. So I just sum up uh, the concentrations. If the derivative of that is zero, it means that that summation is a constant. 
And that's why the null space corresponds to time invariance. So relatively simple mathematics to see that. Conceptually very clear what this is. The column space we're not going to talk much about in this class, but the column space uh, is spanned by the columns of the stoichiometric matrix. And it turns out that the vector of time derivatives lives in that space. And that's relatively easy to see if you do basic mathematics. <coughs> so here I show the, the dynamic mass balances again. I just show it symbolically there, all the columns of S times S. If I multiply that out, I get that element in the flux vector V1 times the first column vector plus the V2 times the second column vector. And that's the definition of a space. That's just the span of the column space. All these columns span that space. Whatever weights I put on these fluxes is a summation of the column vectors, and therefore by definition in the column space. So the dynamic states are going to be in the column space. Uh, and that's just shown here. And you see uh, that uh, just writing it out like this, since S is a, a column vector, if I change a flux, it will potentially affect many uh, uh, concentrations. Okay. So one change can map onto many time derivatives, one flux change. So this is pretty straightforward. And these motions will only take place orthogonal to the left null space. They can't move so that they violate this time invariance. This is a little tougher to see, so let me walk through this uh, carefully. <coughs> so I can also look at the row space. So I'm going to use R there rather than S hat X or superscript X sub I. So this is the row vector. So this is the row vector I showed you earlier. So it's an inner product with the flux vector. And I can write out uh, my dynamic mass balance like this too. So every row vector is in the stoichiometric matrix times the flux vectors. So each individual multiplication here of a row vector times um, all the fluxes will give me the time derivative for one uh, concentration. Okay, uh, so all the fluxes in this case can be mapped onto the, the uh, concentration change of just one node. So all of them can affect one. Okay, so that middle equation there has R um, sub I times X. So that's an inner product of two vectors. And that is shown uh, here on this slide, so I'll talk a little bit more about this. So we know how to do inner products. Uh, it's the length of the vectors times the angle between them. And I can describe that uh, here uh, with this diagram. So the vector R is fixed. It doesn't change. It's in, it's in the stoichiometric matrix. It's just a vector in this n-dimensional space, uh, n n-dimensional space. Uh, flux vector is n-dimensional, and these row vectors are n-dimensional because you go across n columns. So this is a fixed vector in that space. Now, if I take the inner product of any flux state in there, I'm basically mapping that point onto that row vector and see what the, the component of that flux vector is that's parallel to that row vector. And so that inner product actually gives me the time derivative for that co corresponding concentration. So the magnitude of that projection is important. And let me show a couple of more projections. So if I have a flux vector over there that creates a large projection onto R sub i, the time derivative for x sub i is going to be large. Conversely, if my flux vector is orthogonal to R, I project it onto R and I get zero. I get nothing. That means there is no driver for change. So these vectors represent basically thermodynamic imbalances in the system. And the steady state flux vectors have to, has to be orthogonal to all of them. And there is, then there is no driver for change. If I imbalance that a little bit, then all these drivers for change show up and start affecting the derivatives. So a little more complicated space to uh, interpret. The null space and the column space are the easiest one to understand. The left null space, you know, fairly easy. The row space is tough like I guess thermodynamics always are. It's a little difficult to deal with this one. All right, so on to the last uh, subject in here, and that is um, uh, a view of S as a part of a model, of a functional <coughs> model of a network. 
and I've already introduced the uh, flux balances earlier. I uh, just want to, uh, on this slide, remind you now we have to deal with units when you, when you look at uh, models. So the fluxes are in moles typically per volume per time. They can be in mass per volume per time, but normally it's moles per volume per time. And the concentrations will be um, uh, moles uh, per volume. And it has, it has to be consistent units throughout the whole equation. Okay, and so if uh, the der time derivatives and the fluxes are in the same units, this is a, a dimensionally consistent equation. All right, so let me just, uh, now I guess I used instead of R in this slide, uh, there is S super X sub I, which is the same vector, just different uh, uh, notations. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more then about this equation. So here is, this is an um, equation that describes um, basically a dynamic flux balance or dynamic mass balance. And if it's in a steady state, then the time derivative is zero, and S dot V is equal to zero. And these are the steady state flux distributions, as we call them. Whatever the solution for V is there, we call about that as a flux distribution because you can map this on to a reaction map and see how the fluxes are distributed throughout the network. If I wanted to compute the dynamic states of that network, I have to now have a reaction rate loss for the fluxes. So these Vs are functions of something. And they will be functions of the concentrations, and those uh, rate loss will have kinetic constants in them. And those are normally pretty hard to get. Um, uh, so if you want to build a dynamic model, you've got to get these rate constants on a network scale, and that is not an easy thing to do. But if you can, you can then substitute uh, those uh, fluxes in there, uh, I mean those rate loss in there into the flux vector, and now you have a differential equation you can simulate or solve. And we actually teach uh, uh, how to do that uh, simulation in an undergraduate class here at UCSD. So, um, just end up here with a couple of concepts associated with now defining a system. So here is a reaction map. Um, and it has some topological properties like I talked about. But if I want to build a model of this, I have to convert this into a system. And one of the most important things in system science is to define the system. What is the system and what's around it? And to do that, you draw what's called a system's boundary. And it defines what's a part of the system and what is outside the system. And then there will be inputs and outputs, things that cross that boundary, enter or leave the system. And um, that's kind of embedded in that matrix equation that I had. So we're going to talk, we're going to formulate models like this. So the boundary can be a physical boundary. We can draw, we could use the cell wall as a boundary, for instance. So everything that comes in and out of a cell. Uh, the mitochondrial membrane can be a boundary. Everything that goes in and out of the mitochondria. But I can also draw a virtual boundary. I can take that big map that I had of um, AF1260 and draw a virtual boundary around, say, cell wall synthesis as a system. And now there are inputs and outputs into it, but there are other parts of the metabolic network. So I can isolate out parts of the net metabolic network if I want to. Often this can be done mathematically by looking at effectively block diagonal representation of the stoichiometric matrix where you have a lot of density of connections in a block and few connections with the rest of the network. That can also be used to define a virtual boundary. And this kind of leads us <coughs> to the three different forms of S that I kind of uh, went through quickly earlier. We can have a stoichiometric matrix <coughs> that describes only the internal reactions in a system. So there's no exchanges taking place. And that's the internal stoichiometric matrix. You can use that, for instance, to solve for loops. You know, there shouldn't be any loops, and you have to zero out all those fluxes, like we'll talk about. Those would be thermodynamically infeasible fluxes. So that's a quality control check, for instance, on a model. Or you can now draw a porous boundary, and some of the uh, components internal to the system can be exchanged with the environment. And uh, this is the most common form of the stoichiometric matrix we used. We draw a boundary around our system, and then the flux is in and out, the boundary fluxes. And then what's outside is just a sink. 
we don't, uh, you know, it's just something comes from the outside, there's something that's done to the outside. But ultimately, the whole universe is closed. So if you can draw, draw a solid boundary around the whole system, and uh, then contain the external um, concentrations. For instance, you might represent a fermentation this way, a batch fermentation. It's a closed vessel, but there's a cellular component in there, and then there's the media. But you, you're interested in what the cell does, but it's going to induce changes in the environment. Drive substrate down, products up, and all like that. And the matrix representation is like this. We normally order the columns by first, kind of in a coarse-grained manner, first by the internal fluxes, and then the boundary fluxes after that. So the difference between the first and the second matrix are just the boundary fluxes. They kind of can be appended or concatenated onto that matrix, uh, if you like, in, in some you know matrix operation. And if I account for the uh, external compounds explicitly, I have to put a block, new block of rows in there that represents the outside compounds. At the uh, lower uh, left uh, block in that matrix has to be zero because none of the external compounds is participating in an internal reaction. So this, this, uh, these matrices have a particular structure to them. And here is a simple case. I think uh, we won't uh, go through that in much detail because this was kind of embedded in the earlier example that I had. Well, maybe I do it. You see the S internal? Is that the matrix there in the top? And then that becomes one of the blocks, uh, the first set of uh, columns in the exchange matrix, and I add the boundary fluxes. And if I add rows at the bottom for the uh, concentrations outside, that is now the uh, top left-hand block in that matrix. And you see below it, it's all zeros, because the uh, compounds outside A and B don't, can't participate in the internal reactions. So the, the boundary fluxes tie the inside to the outside through those columns. OK, so finally, I just want to show you one uh, real uh, um, matrix. So here is now glycolysis represented as a system. In a biochemistry textbook, you see it's topology. But now if you want to build a systems model, I have a boundary. So I have like a solid boundary here and the porous boundary. So the solid boundary in this case would uh, denote exchange fluxes with the actual environment. And then the porous boundary would be exchanges of glycolytic metabolites with the rest of the network. They would be internal. So it makes ATP that's used somewhere else. It makes any DH that's used somewhere else. Or it may make a precursor that goes into biosynthesis. Uh, so this is now a system. And if I formulate the matrix for it, it looks like this. And I've decorated this matrix a little bit with some annotated information. So the stoichiometric matrix itself is there, all the compounds, all the reactions. Down here, I put the QCQA test. I've multiplied by E. And I see that all the columns that correspond to the internal reactions are zeros. So I know this is uh, elementally balanced. The exchange reactions do not, because they will bring elements in or, or put elements to the outside. Uh, I put connectivities at the end of the rows. I get it just put them there. I mean, that's, that's, that's information that's associated with this matrix. And then here is also the uh, participation number. How many compounds are participating in each one of these reactions represented by the columns. So that's an annotated stoichiometric matrix. There's more information to it. And then the columns are, are organized in a certain way. I have the glycolytic reactions, A and P metabolism, exchange reactions, and so forth. So I can organize the columns in a way that I like. All right, so let's wrap this up then, um, summarize a few things. Um, so the stoichiometric matrix S is very important to us. Um, and this uh, lecture kind of summarizes its uh, properties. It is comprised of integers. It's knowable, like I said, very interesting. Um, the uh, columns <coughs> represent uh, the reactions uh, or the links. And the uh, rows represent the nodes or the compounds. There are at least four important um, features of this matrix that are uh, important to us, and I went through them. The fact is a data matrix, it's a connectivity matrix, it's actually a matrix that does mapping from one vector to another, and it is a key part of a functional model of a network. Um, 
the columns are reaction vectors like we talked about and they have to be elementally and charge balanced and that can be done by using the elemental matrix and that's a QCQA test on the matrix. Some quantities are conserved like I mentioned and some are not and so the non-conserved quantities like Gibbs free energy, osmotic pressure and so forth is a property of the role space because those things are changing with the reactions. Um, there are just a few forms of the basic elementary reactions, which I th uh, is worth noting. Few are linear, but most of them are bilinear. The uh, S represents uh, topological uh, properties of the network, and there are maps associated with that. Some of them you have seen, some of them you may not have seen, um, and some of those are uh, worth highlighting. And uh, when you build a system, um, you can describe it in three different ways depending on how you treat the exchange reactions that connect your system uh, with the uh, uh, environment. So that is a brief or maybe somewhat lengthy <laughs> introduction to the stoichiometric matrix. And we are going to dig into its properties in more detail uh, in uh, the subsequent lectures.